Greetings, and welcome back to the Rose Bros Podcast. This episode, we are joined by Cody Battershill, real estate agent and founder of Canada Action, an independent, grassroots, nonpartisan organization that advocates for the responsible development of Canadian resources. Cody has also sat twice on the Board of Governors for the Calgary Real Estate Board and is a former instructor at the Alberta Real Estate Association. He is also a recipient of the Queen Elizabeth Platinum Jubilee Award in Alberta for contributions to Calgary and the energy sector. We sat down for a smooth cup of Rose Rose coffee and discussed the case for Canadian energy and the economic opportunity available to all Canadians. Also, stay tuned until the end of the episode as Cody offers a special promo code on all Canada Action merchandise. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This podcast is sponsored by headracingcanada.com. Looking for high-performance ski gear this winter? In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is offering the lowest prices possible through its online storefront by passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. We can start when if you're ready. I'm ready. Let's <coughs> get into it. Cody Battershell. Thanks very much for doing this. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I am a huge fan of the podcast, so it's really an honor to be sitting here. I know you're busy, so thanks for volunteering your time. Thanks for this delicious cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. We'll call that Rose Rose Coffee for anyone <laughs> listening. <laughs> you are the you're a real estate agent. You are an energy advocate, I think. Are you the co-founder or the founder of Canada Action? Uh, founder of Canada Action and the CEO currently. I, mean, I can't believe how long it's been now. Yeah, and then I, I do Calgaryism as well, which kind of is folded into real estate, talking about the city and just passionate about Calgary and Alberta and our country. So what is Canada Action for anyone listening? Canada Action is a advocacy organization to raise awareness about the importance and value and leading environmental record of Canadian natural resource production, the necessity and the importance of why we should all be more informed and champion Canada's world-class oil, natural gas, mining, farming, forestry, renewable, all of the above in uh, meeting growing global demand with the best benefits for Canadians and the best benefits for the global environment. When did you start Canada Action? So the, the genesis was really all the way back in 2009 with some ducks landing in northern Alberta on a tailings pond. And the global upset about that noticed that Greenpeace was making a really big deal about it. And, you know, of course, they weren't talking about 2.4 billion birds per year. And I believe in just in North America alone that fly into windows, skyscrapers and house cats or, or part of me, it's actually house cats is, is the number one cause. But there was just a disconnect between the impact and the sort of facts. And so that kind of got me interested in the space. And then... 2010, I was in Vancouver and I saw Lush Cosmetics uh, walking. I was walking down the street in Vancouver on a little holiday and I saw Lush Cosmetics saying we need to shut down Canadian oil and gas. I just kind of recognized that that conversation was not balanced. It was not truthful and it was uh, lacking all of the important global context. And of course, as a real estate agent, I saw the day-to-day -day impact of energy on me, even though I wasn't in energy. That's something I think all Canadians can really benefit from and learn from is that we're all invested in resources as Canadians, uh, whether we realize that or not. That's rare for somebody who doesn't work in energy to recognize the importance and the value of it. Are you from Calgary? Or how did, where did that seed kind of start? You know, I'm from Calgary and it, neither of my parents were in energy, but you know, you grow up in Calgary and you see the impact that it, that energy has had on the city. You see the, of course the jobs, and then there's the sort of economic benefits, which we don't always everyday people don't always just understand like what is GDP and oh great the government got a billion is it a million is it a trillion why does it matter but 
Aside from the jobs and the economic benefits, there's also the community investment. There's also the charitable investment. There's also the time. And I, I kind of knew how important energy was to Calgary just growing up here. Then when I became a realtor and I started to recognize, wow, a lot of my clients work in energy. A lot of my clients are able to feed their families and pay their mortgages. This is something that's really important to the city, but also to the world as demand continues to grow. And the, the more you learn about it, the more you recognize that we are world leaders in protecting the environment, protecting people, worker safety, human rights. There was one client I had named uh, Michael, and he was sort of mid forties. He had moved from Quebec where he had lost his job in pulp and paper, and he was able to actually retrain and go work in the oil sands. And it's really hard work away from your family for a long period of time. But what, he was able to buy a home. And I remember when I gave him the keys, he was crying because he, and he said, I never thought I'd be able to buy a home for my wife and my children. And it was, uh, it was a really, it was a really, uh, touching moment to kind of connect what energy is at a more emotional day to day, real life, family to family level, especially the, the, the economic impacts of it. So that was, uh, that was a big turning point for me. And I just, you know, seeing Lush Cosmetics and seeing the disconnect between impact and what people were saying about us, what people still say about us collectively as Calgarians, Albertans, oil and gas industry supporters and Canadians. I just thought, you know, man, we should really start speaking up and trying to correct some of that and maybe even get proactive and try to actively market what we're doing. Why does the energy industry need an advocate? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I just don't think the industry is really built for public awareness, for advertising. Typically in the energy industry, when you're talking about marketing, you're talking about commodity marketing and commodity price risk, and it's completely different. And even going back to the sort of twilight, the, the origin of the modern day oil and gas industry, sort of like John D. Rockefeller and Pennsylvania, you know, mid to late 1800s, the industry was always kind of behind the scenes. You know, most people only really ever still think about oil and gas when they're going to pay their, uh, to fill up gasoline or when they pay their natural gas uh, heating bill. I think with the advent of social media, and the advent of more modern forms of organizing and communicating, opponents of Canadian oil and gas or opponents uh, looking for some sort of a symbolic win for their movements sort of targeted Canada. And I think that as a Canadian, I just thought, you know, I wanted to do something about it. I wanted to, you know, help correct the facts, you know, really. I was dismayed certainly that the industry wasn't, you know, the industry in, in Canada wasn't doing a lot. And that the entire industry was sort of branded as this open pit mine. And that certainly is not the case. And there's also certainly no mention of land reclamation standards and uh, a lot. There's just, there's so much more there to unpack. But I just, uh, I just thought it was wrong and wanted to, you know, wanted to do something about it. From the perspective of somebody who's worked in the industry it's or for someone who's heard the message about the positive aspects of Canadian energy, everybody knows the good attributes about Canadian energy. But it seems like what we don't talk about as much sometimes is what flip side is what we're missing out on by not developing Canadian energy. And from your perspective, what are Canadians missing out by not appreciating Canadian energy? Well, that's a really good question. And we're missing out on a lot of economic opportunity. We're missing out on a lot of opportunity to potentially hire more teachers and reduce class sizes. We're missing out on opportunity to reduce government debt and reduce interest on that debt that could then go and flow back into society to pay for other things that are fundamental components of every Canadian's quality of living, like hiring more nurses and more doctors and upgrading and getting more diagnostic equipment to reduce wait times. In some provinces, they have, I think out in the Atlantic, the Newfoundland has a wait list of 100,000 patients waiting for a family doctor. That just shouldn't be the case. Certainly, Canadian energy is not just Alberta. It is uh, national in scope and national in terms of its benefits in the supply chain and also where people have moved from to participate in the industry and in all resources. So I think as Canadians, we're missing out on the global context, the big picture, that as we sit around, and certainly we've made a lot of progress, but as we 
if you look at LNG, for example, we've been talking about LNG now for 13, 14, 15 years in the current cycle, but Canada also missed the LNG boat late 70s, early 80s. Yes, there's economics and yes, there's commodity pricing considerations, but a huge part of it is government capacity to get on board with projects that are in the national interest when we look out at the longer term demand and to get stuff done and to, you know, acknowledge that there's some a very loud, vocal, but small voice, often paid professional, full time protesters and protest groups spreading misinformation and falsehoods, trying to whip up opposition that is not in the public interest or often rooted in the facts. And so we really need to, you know, make sure that, you know, that context, right? What has the U.S. done in that time frame? They've gone on to become the world's largest LNG exporter. What has Australia done? They've spent as much or more than we have in the oil sands to become one of the world's top three exporters as well. And then, of course, Qatar, and uh, what are they continuing to do? They're, ex- they're signing deals that start in 2027 with countries like Germany, China, and others who've recently been in Canada asking for us to also contribute. So we're missing out on obviously the economic and quality of life impacts, but we're also missing out on the global big picture and how Canada can and should better manage our resource wealth as we align that with our strategic goals as a country to help on the environment, reducing emissions, and also energy security. Why do you think Canada has been singled out if you compare it to the USA? It doesn't seem like there's as much targeting of U.S. energy production as there is Canada. Why do you think that is? So if you, you know, work at Greenpeace and you hear that, you'll say, oh, no, there's Greenpeace offices all over the world. But where are those Greenpeace offices located? Are they located in some of the world's other top 10 reserve countries? Uh, no. Are they located, are they actively organizing protests in the Middle East? No. And it's a testament back to uh, the fact that Canada is a free, transparent, and open society, and that it actually, for those reasons, it deserves even more support for our responsibly produced uh, resources. I think, uh, so those protesters would say, well, there is opposition in the U.S. Well, not in a way that has caused every single export project to be substantially delayed, substantially over budget. And so the U.S. now, I believe they're at seven operating projects. They're going to probably see uh, final investment decisions in the next couple months on another three or four projects. They've got a long-term game plan. They're actually buying Canadian natural gas cheap and then, you know, cheaper and then getting global price. And they've been doing that as well with Canadian heavy oil, right, uh, down into the Gulf Coast. So there's been a huge benefit for the U.S., End of 2018, we had uh, the world's cheapest oil when the WCS differential was 40-ish. So we're selling the most responsible barrel in the world at the cheapest price. And there's a massive disconnect. You even just see at McDonald's, right? They're talking about their ethical coffee beans. They're talking about ethical chocolate, ethical cotton. And what about ethical Canadian energy? Now, maybe that term has been used or misused, but just talking about the fundamental values of what it means to care about where something is produced, how it's produced, want to get more of that to the world for the net benefits is something that we can all hold our heads high and really champion. It's been super interesting. I mean, obviously we have Trans Mountain that's going to be done here in the next kind of 12 months, but Northern Gateway would have already been operating and that's very large crude carriers. The economics to Asia are significantly better than Trans Mountain with smaller tankers. And at one point there was like a 12 LNG projects in BC that were planned. Now we have one large project that's under construction. Great. Several other indigenous led projects that are kind of now waiting in this sort of regulatory slow moving system. And uh, meanwhile, the rest of the world is, is really um, capitalizing. So It's been interesting. It's been unfortunate. The one quote that's always stuck with me, Bill McKibben, who leads 350.org, was one of the biggest kind of people, spokespeople, I guess you could say, against Keystone XL. And that was really the project that started the big pipeline opposition. And he said in Rolling Stone that Keystone XL was essentially a symbolic fight to try to get an ideological symbolic win for the climate change movement. And I guess great if you're all about symbol, you know, symbolism. 
Uh, but what happened was Keystone XL wasn't built and the U.S. was importing more from Venezuela, Ecuador, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, and Mexico, the, uh, the other top heavy oil suppliers. And those countries don't all have the same climate emissions standards and goals, as well as obviously human rights and there's other energy and strategic concerns. So was Bill, did Bill McKibben blocking Keystone XL have a positive impact on the global environment? Absolutely not. It only helped other suppliers and cost Canada and Canadian families a lot of money. Same goes for Energy East. We should be importing less and we should be maximizing the value of our resources. That's the smart thing to do. The Maximizing the value of anything we sell as Canadians is the smart thing to do. So that's a really long answer, but there's, there's a lot to kind of unpack there. And, you know, I think it's just important to kind of deal with some of those immediate fallacies, those, the opposition talking points, you know, oh, well, there are protests everywhere. Well, what have they done? I mean, in Canada, they've been very effective, very organized, and very effective. And what have they done in other places? Other places are at all-time high production and have built out entire massive new industries where we've just been chit-chatting about it. Right. Do you think it's because politically they just don't have the backbone to support industry in Canada? Do you think the pockets aren't deep enough in Canada to support the, their interests? Or why do you think Canada has been so influenced by opaque green energy policies compared to, say, the U.S. or other leading Western countries? I think one of the biggest things in Canada is that you have oil and gas production. So, so, so we have a very large country. You know, we want to build, for example, Energy East. And we need to go through a bunch of provinces that don't have any rigs, any production, any real history. And people don't understand. And then the void, the vacuum of information is filled by Bill McKibben and anti-pipeline groups. And they're pulling stunts, five people screaming at a regulatory hearing, and it gets news attention. It's a very sophisticated and well-organized attempt for those groups to block infrastructure and just simply ignore the consequences of their actions. I think in Canada, we really need to work hard at reducing polarization. We really need to try to increase the level of decorum. And we have to really focus on Ontario and Quebec. It's been a focus for us for many years. But Ontario and Quebec don't know what they don't know about oil and gas. And there's genuinely a lot of well-meaning people who literally think we can go 100% renewable tomorrow because that's what they've been told by Greenpeace, etc. cetera. Uh, we know that that's not technologically feasible. We know that that's not a pragmatic approach to managing families' livelihoods and lives. We know that we'll need all energy sources for a long time to come. And it's okay to be inclusive and support all energy production, not wind and solar at the expense of oil and gas or vice versa, but support it all. We're a leader in clean tech and innovation and environmental protection spending in the oil and gas industry in Canada is a leader in non-emitting power generation and renewable investment. Uh, the oil and gas industry has had a huge hand in a lot of that, but we will need all of it. So uh, the technology is not quite there yet for battery storage. While a lot of these protest groups have been saying we don't need Canadian pipelines because demand is going to peak, what has demand done? Oil, since, since the start of Keystone XL protests, oil demand is up 12, 13 million barrels a day. When the same groups continue to say the same things that have been proven false, it just means that they have no credibility. People should stop listening to them and we should continue to seize the opportunity to get a positive, fact-based, respectful, inclusive, nonpartisan message out. Um, I always say nonpartisan because... I've always felt very strongly about the fact that it doesn't matter who you vote for. We shouldn't be playing games with the economy, with energy, with livelihoods. It doesn't matter who you vote for. One plus one equals two. So let's try to eliminate energy as a wedge issue for different political parties and different activist groups. Reach people all across the country under that unified sort of Team Canada a banner, make sure that the facts are being told and people can base their opinions on a, a balanced uh, set of understanding. What's unfortunate is that the green energy policies that are pretty opaque seem to have almost backfired. I'm a big skier. I love the outdoors, go to the mountains every weekend. So it seems like we're all kind of 
on the same page in the sense we want a cleaner environment, but at the same time, what happens is that now coal's at an all time high. Coal production is an all time high now. So what your green policies have actually backfired on you. You're farther back than you were in the beginning. Why do you think that break is occurring and for from well meaning policy? I think that a lot of people are really focused on absorbing headlines. Right. It's quick media hits, it's quick it's TikToks and it's you know, I don't know if people read as much anymore, especially younger people. I think really going in depth into some of these issues, it's not always, um, I don't think it's happening. You look, a perfect example is exporting Canadian natural gas liquefied to growing demand in Asia and around the world. And um, that would reduce, that would reduce emissions. It would, you know, you build a couple plants comparable to LNG Canada. And now you've taken the equivalent to every single car in Canada off the road, just with, just with those exports. And so is it really fair and reasonable to say that you, as a, you know, protest group or protester are only focused on climate, and then you don't want to actually reduce emissions by exporting natural gas? There's a bit of a disconnect in a lot of that. Um, you know, if we maximize the value of our resources, we have more money to invest in the green line, in wind, in, uh, you know, other, other technologies, other innovation. The uh, first wind turbine in Canada was Pincher Creek, Alberta, 1993. And we're, I think we're ninth in the world for wind capacity right now, installed wind capacity with the 38th or 39th largest population. In a very cold country most of the year. <laughs> so we have so much to really be proud of that I just think it's a real it's a real travesty. Well that's the thing. I don't understand where that break break comes from because it's well meaning policies seem to end up backfiring and I just curious where do you think that comes from? I think, you know, Canada as a country we tend to kind of be a little bit more in the shadow of the U.S. A lot of the SNL skits about Canada are, you know, Canadians just apologizing for everything all the time. And I think we still have an opportunity to truly assert the full potential and, and to really assert the full weight of our strategic assets, of our natural resources as a force for good in the world, for energy security, for democracy, and for reducing emissions and, and increasing environmental protection. And all of that benefits Canadian families many times over. So I still think we have that potential, but we can't just ignore what's happening with oil and gas demand. We can't ignore the fact that, oh, great, we're selling more EVs in the US. So gasoline demands dropped ever so slightly, but guess what? Pet chem demand has increased and we're making, you know, you can't make an electric vehicle without a lot of mining, a lot of advanced plastics and a lot of petroleum. Um, you can't make most things in life without petroleum. So there's much more nuance to it. And you have election cycles, you know, every four years or less, and you have just a lot of people who have, who, who, genuinely are very passionate about the environment, but maybe just don't understand the global consequence. And that's why I, I say all the time, why are the groups who want to shut down Trans Mountain not also opposing Alaskan tankers in the same waterways in the same regions on the West Coast? And why are those groups not fighting Energy East and not opposing the barrels that come in on a tanker from the Middle East from time to time? out on the East Coast. There's just a disconnect. I think that symbolic sort of reasoning from Bill McKibben says a lot, explains a lot. And uh, Canada has been a bit of a soft, softer target. You can protest here. It's, a, it's great that people can speak their minds and it's great that people can share their views because in a lot of other countries you can't. But collectively, our leaders, our communities, Canadians, we all need to get together to kind of say, look, enough's enough. We can do energy and the environment. We must do oil and wind and solar and gas and hydro and small modular reactors. There's Canadians working all over the world in oil and gas production. 
Uh, we've exported so much knowledge and know-how. So many other jurisdictions have come to learn how we've regulated the industry. We are a world leader many times over. Every single person who works in our natural resource sector and our oil and gas sector should go home every single day and hold their head high, feeding their families and contributing massively to both Canada and the, the, the world. And that's something that we're trying to, at Canada Action, continually raise awareness around and let people know that we are a part of a larger group, often a soft-spoken or silent but majority of Canadians who want to have that reasonable conversation. And we really should all be holding our heads high. <clears throat> you spend a lot of time researching the Canadian energy industry and everything that goes on with it. What's the biggest misconception you've experienced with the way people view Canadian energy? Is there one that sticks out in your mind? Well, it's been unfortunate that for the last 15 years, the number one media image, if you have anything about Canadian oil and gas on a big media story, it's often been a stock photo of an open pit mine. And open pit mining is less than 50% of oil sands production. It's, you know, 20% of the reserves and it's 3% of the total land area could ever be developed using open pit mining. And it will never reach that much. When you look at the numbers, it's again, the impact and the attention are disconnected. And then of course, there's never any mention about reclamation, but that's just oil sands. What about our conventional industry that's leading the world in reducing flaring, methane, water usage, pad drilling, working with indigenous communities as partners, and just all of the advancements that we make. So I, I feel like if I, you know, that would be one. And uh, the other one that I just think pe people just don't understand energy. People still think that you just turn on a light switch and that's energy. You just go to the gas station and that's where it came from. And they don't understand the complexity. And it can be hard sometimes to distill incredibly con complex industrial processes from the original seismic to the actual production, to the actual transportation, to the actual refining, to the actual ethylene pet cam facility and back into the consumer's hands or the consumer's homes. It's a, it's a very, it's very complex. We have to continually try to distill some of these complex ideas down into more simple, easy to understand pieces of information. The more that people learn and know about the oil and gas industry, uh, I can't tell you how many people have been positively shocked in a good way to find out that that one thing they thought or that they heard. I had one, one time so someone said to me, well, if the Canadian oil and gas industry wasn't 30% of global emissions, no one would oppose it. 30% of global emissions, right? And that's the, just the level of misunderstanding. And it's egregious, of course. Are there any facts or lines of reasoning that seem to resonate better when you're trying to explain to people the value in Canadian energy? Is there a way to approach it that seems to work? You know, we make a lot of content. And we, I think we made over 1,000 graphics yeah. last year. Yeah. Those graphics are, you know, on Google image searches. Those graphics are being shared by people, downloaded, screenshotted. Those graphics tell a story. They also are able to spread the positive message and the positive, the positivity that is the industry. And I think there's just a lot of misunderstanding about the energy transformation, uh, the, the energy transition, previous energy transitions and the current sort of transformation that's happening and how long that's actually going to take you know, the intermittency problem of certain sources of power and, you know, the continual effort people don't understand. And I'm certainly not sitting here saying that the oil and gas industry has always been perfect and that there's nothing else to do. It is a game of continual improvement on safety, on environment, on community, on indigenous relationships, but we're doing it. We're working really hard to always get better and I don't think people understand that. I don't think people see the industry and think about the faces of the families and the communities that depend on it. I don't think people actually look around in their day-to-day -day life and recognize that everything 
is made from or made possible thanks to oil and natural gas. People don't know those things. So, you know, a big message that we've been sharing in Ottawa has been, in the Ottawa region, just has been simply that the world will need oil and gas for decades to come. Where should it come from? Does it come from Canada with the highest ESG is, is talked about a lot, but we do in fact have the highest ESG standards on many different metrics, a, a real commitment to reducing emissions. So should it come from Canada or should it come from on a radio debate I did in Vancouver, an anti-pipeline guy was saying, you know, Saudi Arabia just sticks a straw in the ground and they get oil and we have to do way more to do it. And he was like almost, I guess, saying or sort of supporting Saudi Arabia, implying that we should get it from Saudi Arabia. Uh, okay, that's a pretty weird statement if you care about human rights or the environment or transparency or a lot of other things, but pe people just don't know. So we just got to... We work really hard. It's like, it's a marathon. Right. Um, I can't believe I've been kind of doing this now for 13 years. Yeah. It's crazy. There's currently a movement to transition, just transition into yeah. well, different energy sources. But the problem with that is that there is no, there's nothing to transition to right now. There's no, there's nothing to replace completely natural gas and oil production. So what would your response be to the just transition idea and movement? Well, the term just transition is used a lot by people who are often well organized and often paid at groups like Greenpeace. Their message is to shut oil and gas production down. Although, as you just said, there's no replacement. So what it means is shut down Canada and then everyone can wake up and see how fast we can build import infrastructure and shut down our way of life, shut down our modern society. There's nothing to replace it right now. So, uh, you know, just transition is a very interesting phrase uh, that I think we should avoid. We, we need to, again, as I said earlier, r reduce polarization. And I honestly believe that when, you know, someone from environmental defense is talking about the just transition, they're increasing polarization. They're, in, they're almost intentionally trying to alienate people because there's no substitute and you're talking about feeding people, men and women feeding their children, paying their mortgages. And what solution do you have for them that we should just import everything and everyone should be unemployed. It's not a solution. So I recently, uh, I've been talking about the fact that if we want to talk just transition, we got to be talking about the long term reality of the transformation and that includes maximizing the value of our resources as we support an inclusive strategy for all families, all resource production, and all energy sources. And that, sure. So, yeah, go wind and go solar and go Canadian oil and gas. Right. That's the thing that I think people miss on both sides is that when you say just transition, you don't have a plan for what you replace natural gas and oil with. But sometimes people on the traditional energy side don't have a understanding or a... I guess, perspective on also needing wind and thermal and geothermal, all that. Maybe most people are in the middle. It just doesn't seem like there's that reasonable discussion on the fact that you're going to need all energy. Yeah. It's not just one or the other. Yeah. The world needs more Canadian energy and that's all of the above. Yeah. And as long as the world's using oil and gas, it should come from Canada. As long as the world's using, needs fertilizer, it should, it should be coming from Canada. We need forestry, forestry products. We need a whole lot more mining for a lot of these electric vehicle targets. Why would we, why would we hurt ourselves for no net environmental benefit globally? It doesn't actually make any sense. People who want to shut down Canadian oil and gas are only helping other producers with inferior standards. They're not being pragmatic about the reality of energy usage and I mean, recently people talking about gas stoves, there's a couple billion people that would, th that actually need gas. They need access to natural gas stoves and electricity because they're cooking with a variety of other far more harmful, uh, like they're cooking with animal waste and hay and, and dung and, and, you know, other, other sources of, of, of heat. The conversation, we just have to always try to bring it back to that positive message 
really we need to, you know, we are, and we need to continue trying to take, you know, take back the moral high ground. Canadian energy is a positive force for people on the planet. Mm -hmm. And as Canadians, we should be proud of that. Do you worry that people undermining the traditional energy business in Canada are actually doing a pretty good job and that's working? If you, I think to myself, for instance, sometimes when, or when an industry needs advocates, that's almost like a red flag. The, a lot of the best tech businesses don't necessarily need an advocacy group to uh, prove their, their investment uh, credentials. Does it worry you that maybe these things are going really well for people like that? That's, that's a really good question. I think, I hope that Canada Action has helped prove that we do need to tell our story. Mm -hmm. We can tell our story in a way that's positive, respectful, and nonpartisan. And as we tell our story, more Canadians will start to understand and we can make progress. Mm -hmm. And I would say that I'm really happy again that Trans Mountain is almost done. Coastal Gas Link is almost done. LNG Canada is well underway. There's more projects. Uh, oil production in Alberta, I believe, just reached an all-time high. And there's, you know, some positive things happening offshore the Atlantic provinces and in BC and in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and even some production in Manitoba. I, th I think there's more, you know, we hear the positive comments every day from across the country about you know, I didn't know that. Thanks for sharing that. Or yes, I support Canadian oil and gas too, or I support Canadian resources too. I think we've made a lot of progress. I think we still have a lot of work left to do, but I think we've made a lot of progress. Another way to look at it is that the fact is that oil demand's growing and natural gas demand's growing. Maybe the market will just solve the inefficiency that seems to be going on right now and that eventually you won't even need an advocacy group because there'll be so much demand for the product. Have you ever thought of it from that perspective? I think that as long as as long as there's as long as there's people who are sharing who are intentionally sharing an often misleading message about Canadian resources, there will be uh, a necessity for Canada action. I think that as long as people in other parts of the country don't understand other subsectors, again, you know, do we understand forestry in Quebec? Does Quebec understand oil and gas in Alberta and BC? No and no. So as long as that's the case, we need to bring people together and we can only get stronger by doing that and by, by reducing that polarization. And as our elected leaders of any political stripe continue to learn more themselves, hear more from their constituents, and hear more from across the country about the importance of that inclusive, a truly inclusive policy and strategy and approach, we can only get better. We can only bring more investment, more jobs, and hopefully over time, more production that we can sell uh, to diversified trading partners around the world. Certainly the inefficiencies with infrastructure has meant that, again, we're selling to the U.S. and you know they're exporting like they turn around and sell at a higher ca price. <laughs> Canadian oil is reaching Asia, but it's through it's through uh, ports in the U.S. Right. So I think over time we can hopefully continue to fix some of those inefficiencies, help get more Canadians on board with the the reality, the length of the transformation, the reality of our true actual environment and climate record. The reason why we're a very, very unique, blessed jurisdiction in this world, where you have a transparent, democratic society that is blessed with all types of resources. And that's only going to become more important as the population grows globally and as more people, more families try, aspire to better quality of living like what we have. And there's billions of people who want to, who, who just dream of living like we live now. They're going to use a lot more oil and natural gas, and they're going to need a lot more food and a lot more mining and a lot more everything that makes up our material world today. In terms of evaluating Canada Action and your advocacy scorecard, I guess you might say, when yeah. you look at yourself in the mirror, yeah. how would you evaluate your success or your failures? How do you think of it from that perspective? Is it $10 natural gas price when things are working normally again? Or how do you, oh, how do you think of that? It's so nice to see some positivity again, people smiling and, you know, maybe less people worried about obviously job security. Mm. Now I think that 
we see how much the industry is bringing in for for our governments, for our social spending. That's a huge positive. You know, it's mm-hmm. a half trillion from 2000 till 2019 and another half trillion potential in the next 10 years. Mm-hmm. It's massive. Mm-hmm. And I would say we're really, really proud of our brand. We're really proud of our merchandise. We're really proud that people from all over the country are paying money, are spending their own hard-earned dollars to buy a shirt that proudly shows everyone who sees them that they're supportive of whatever, you know, their natural resource is. And we have shirts for everything. But people from all over the country buying I Love Oil and Gas shirts to say, hey, you know what? I've learned more about it. And what we're hearing, that that's not always balance. That's not the whole story. Oh, wait a second. Oil demand's still growing and the same people who have been saying it's going to stop for a decade have been proven wrong for a decade and they're still saying the same thing. So we need to, you know, continue to kind of band together. I'm really proud of of the way we, we're trying to bring people together. And I'm really proud of just the network. I mean, we reached a lot, you know, millions of Canadians last year and uh, really proud of the way we're able to do that, trying to distill more complex information down into more bite-sized and absorbable uh, forms on social media. And then in addition to our, the massive growth on our web traffic and, you know, Google's actually using Canada Action as a resource for some of its questions and answers on the organic search engine results. There's a lot of little metrics that we kind of have internally for success, continuing to grow our youth program, Young Canadians for Resources, to make sure that young Canadians understand that there might be a group who wants to divest Canadian oil and gas. And ultimately, the consequence of that is it's not good for people. It's not good for the planet, but they might want to do that. And they think that they're passionate, but they maybe don't understand the consequences. Well, we want to also make sure that young Canadians have another outlet to learn more and maybe become a part of the growing chorus of Canadians at large that are more informed and more supportive and speaking up a little bit more loudly about the importance of supporting locally produced Canadian resources. And so that's Young Canadians for Resources. We're really proud of of that program as well. I mean, I'm proud of all the radio debates and a lot of the media we've been able to do. It's been, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's such an easy story to tell. And there's still, you know, there's still a lot of work to do, but I'm really proud of our, of our progress. I think when I see some of our messaging or derivatives of our messaging used elsewhere, it's, it's a really a moment, uh, a, a, a moment of pride for us. And I always like to say that, you know, for the industry at large, for all Canadians and for all Canadian resource industries, and specifically with the oil and gas industry, essentially think of it like a naval fleet floating across the ocean. Everyone is its own separate entity, but they're all going in the same direction. And so if we care about increasing protection for human rights and worker safety, if we care about increasing social spending and quality of life and living for all Canadians across the country in every province and every region, and if we care about protecting the global environment, then supporting Canadian oil and gas and Canadian resources is the right thing to do. I think that naval fleet idea is is really important. So we can all work together and, uh, again, try to just raise decorum, raise understanding, reduce the polarization that's so prevalent online and, and so prevalent in the world nowadays. But it's a really easy thing for me to do every day. I'm really passionate about it. And um, it's been a lot of fun. So I, I hope we're making a difference. I think we're making a difference. We're going to keep at it. In theory, if you do your job well, they won't need a candidate action anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we worry about the fact you might have a job after if you do your job. Uh, well. I would be, I would be okay with that. <laughs> if we were collectively able to come together as a country and 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 really em- seize the opportunity and and really become the embodiment of that inclusive strategy about economic development and resource production, I would be totally okay with that. <laughs> We'd probably keep the online store going yeah. in perpetuity, but. I would be okay with that. That would be uh, just a a huge testament to uh, national success. A critical voice from the public might say, why doesn't the person leading the energy company speak up and and say the message themselves? Really put skin in the game from their own perspective. Have you ever thought of it from from that point of view that why does the energy advocacy group need to take on this job? You know, I think that there are a lot of really amazing leaders in the industry who do, who, who are, 
sort of managing their companies and managing their businesses and then also doing their best to speak up. I think that, you know, sometimes the message is just as important as the messenger. And so having an independent group outside of even industry associations, I think it can only be complementary. And I think, you know, sort of the unique lens that we've brought with, you know, sort of the, sort of the hybrid strategy between merchandise, traditional, digital uh, forms of advertising, and really trying to create the movement, um, you know, the community-based movement where we're, you know, talking about workers, we're talking about communities is, I think, very unique. I think it's it's complementary because we have a a great and big story to tell, and I think you know for a lot of those leaders to 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 do what they're able to do for the associations to do what they're able to do, and then for us, I think it's only complementary. So, I think it's uh, you know we're a needed voice, and uh, certainly, you know the more the more people that are speaking up, the better. One thing I noticed about a guy like Chris Lubicki, for instance, is yep. that although he doesn't have an energy company anymore, he's he's been willing to stick his neck out and actually tell that yep. story. And he has leverage. He's a person with successful energy executive that yep. is willing to go out of his way and tell the story. Yeah, Chris has been a big advocate just for the industry at large and for sharing, you know, the story of what we're doing on a lot of things we've already talked about with new audiences and at post-secondary institutions and with, you know, different audiences across the country. And uh, we just need we just need more of that. You know, we need to all recognize that we're all Canadian. We're all in this together. And oil and gas production in, you know, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia has helped fund a lot of government spending in a lot of other provinces. It's helped create opportunities for families, for young people from other provinces to be able to have mobility and move around. It's allowed a lot of people to work really hard and and provide a good quality of life for their children and their families. And it's something that we can all be proud of as Canadians, as people learn more about the reality of growing oil and gas demand. And even when oil demand peaks, it's still going to remain a hundred, you know, what, what will it be? A hundred million barrels a day as a, as a plateau in 10 or 15 or 20 years, it will, you know, I saw one estimate that if all electric vehicles were, if all new vehicles were electric in, you know, the 2040s, oil demand would still be 80, 90 million barrels a day. But where should that oil come from? It should come from Canada all day, every day. Canada should be a choice supplier because of our values, because of what we're doing. So I think, you know, we need more people to understand to, to be able to have the opportunity to learn, to also be, you know, confident to speak up. Again, the more you learn about it, the more it, it, it's something that uh, we can all really, I think, champion. Should be We should be champions of it. Another way that makes sense for me, I said this on the podcast with Chris Lubicki, is that the economic cog wheel, one, one wheel turns here, it turns a whole bunch of other wheels elsewhere. Yeah. When one engine's firing here, it starts to spin other engines in other parts of the country and that benefits everyone, just like you were saying. Yeah, that's, I, I love how you explain that. You know, you were talking about uh, that, you're talking about, you know, widgets. Yeah. And we do have to recognize that there's a massive supply chain uh, in other provinces. Yeah. And, you know, how is that benefiting those small businesses and those economies, those communities, in addition to potential transfers from province to province and uh, nationally from a, from a, you know, income generation standpoint. So it is smart to maximize the value of our resources. It's smart to try to reduce oil and gas imports into Canada to increase our own energy security as a nation, our energy independence, like we did with the railroad and with, you know, certain public works like the Trans Canada Highway, we do have, I think, this imperative to sort of think about our energy and our resources as uh, a similar strategic importance. It's great to see the world's largest potash mine starting under, you know, it's under construction now in Saskatchewan. It's, it's, it's you know, big. We're one of, I think, six or seven countries that's a next ex net exporter of food. And when you look at the world's top reserves of oil and natural gas, we are right up there with just a couple other countries for many metrics of many values that that people listening would would often say that and, and even protest groups would say they often care about so uh, there's really no better place uh, than Canada yeah we just got to keep getting the message out so 
you know, especially in, in other more populated provinces that don't, you know, know the industry firsthand. That covers the waterfront mostly, I think. <laughs> if, if you were to leave the listener with, why should the average person support Canadian energy? And, and if they're not, what are they missing out on? Yeah, I would say that we should all support Canadian energy because it's locally produced and we're supporting local Canadian families, people. And that's uh, one of the number one reasons. And as long as the world needs something that we're producing, it should be coming from Canada. Just from a patriotic, self-serving, self-interest standpoint, as Canadians, it only makes sense to support Canadian resource production and Canadian Canadian business. And I think that as people learn more about our record compared to certain other comp- competitors, it's easier to understand the environmental uh, benefits as well uh, from a global context. So, you know, we have such a good story to tell. It's it's just got to keep getting that message out. I think it's uh, it's it's really easy once you know. And what are, what are Canadians missing out on by not seizing that opportunity? Is it billions of dollars in transfer payments? Is it hospitals? Is it schools? Is it roads? You could you could distill it down to the number of hospitals or the smaller class sizes or the potential for better services in a lot of parts of the country. You could. It is, you know, going back about 10 years now, there was at one point three or four hundred billion dollars of cancelled projects. And when we think about investment, cancelled investment, investment equals jobs. And investment in jobs equal social spending, government revenues. So Canadian companies buying assets elsewhere because it wasn't, you know, we couldn't get stuff built. And so we're missing out selling our stuff cheap for others to then maximize and capture the full value. You know, we've been missing out on a lot of the kind of the big picture. You know, we've been told we don't need it. That's been proven false time and time again. And as we learn more about how we are continually improving, it's really easy to uh, to get behind Canadian resource production, Canadian oil and gas. Well, that's a great conversation. If someone wanted to learn more about Canon Action and what you guys are up to and how do you support Canadian Energy, where would they find you guys? So across social media, Canada Action, and then uh, our website, canadaaction.ca. We do have an online store, and uh, I just, before coming, prepared a quick little promo. So if anyone listening wants to check out our online store and buy something, you can use a promo code for 25% off, and the promo code is CANADA25, C-A-N-A-D-A-2-5. That will uh, give you 25% off. Really appreciate any and all support. The more people that wear a shirt or have a sign on their property or have a bumper sticker or follow us on social and share something, the more other Canadians recognize that there is a sort of large and growing group that's uh, speaking up and they're not alone in um, understanding more about the industry and being proud of what we do. Well, that's great. Hopefully, if all goes well, you won't need to work at a Canon Action put, anymore in a few put, years. Put <laughs> myself out of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. In the meantime, that was a great conversation. I appreciate your time. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully, you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca, where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking.